Hello there, ladies, gentlemen and unicorns. Long time no see and as always, I'm having technical difficulties. Uh, it's not so bad this time, so at least we're online and I hope you can hear me. Please let me know in the chat if you can hear me and that you can see me. YouTube is telling me I'm live, that my stream status is excellent, probably because of all you watching. And the problems that I'm having this time uh, pertains to uh, the OBS studio. For some reason, I can't switch uh, to studio mode. So when there's some hiccups there with selecting different uh, uh, scenes and such, um, I'm, I'm really sorry, please, please bear with me. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a little bit more... Um, uh, what, what, what's the right word? It's improvised than it usually is. So again, thank you so much for uh, joining me today uh, on very short notice because as uh, dumb as that I am, I've completely forgot to send out a link to this very stream. So again, thank you so much. Uh, here we are. Uh, Kersey Boo um, writes up in only emojis that the audio seems to be fine. I hope it's even in sync a little bit more than... <laughs> Than usual and yes about today I thought uh, because uh, the last two weeks I wasn't uh, available to stream because uh, two weeks ago I was just completely stressed out with work and last week I also had some work to do which uh, required some uh, creative modeling techniques because yeah I, I'm under NDA so I can't really tell what I'm doing but I had uh, one surface that was really hard to model and in the end I thought huh I could do this with photogrammetry and this is what we're going to talk about and how you can use photogrammetry um, with uh, mostly free tools um, to get 3D models from uh, models in the real world and I walk you through a, a little uh, test project that I just started an hour before <laughs> so uh, we will see how this goes uh, if, if, if it goes all right but I think this is the fun of it to see where things fall apart where, where things you, you that don't work and which brings us to the first uh, technical difficulty of today and that was uh, trying to do this whole capturing of this real world object live it didn't work uh, for just the single reason that um, with this uh, Sony Handycam, uh, when you have an HDMI output, you get the video fine, but what you don't get is audio. And I didn't have any more inputs or ideas of how to get clean audio from me over there uh, photographing uh, the object in question. So. What I did was uh, rather hastily, I pre-produced a little video. It's 10 minutes or so of uh, taking the pictures and what to uh, look out for when taking the pictures and so on and so forth. And yeah, I want to show you this little video and then we get straight back into it uh, on doing uh, yeah, the, the rest of photogrammetry processing. What will you need? Uh, first of all, when you do a uh, photogrammetry, well, of course you need to have an object uh, it, it helps if it's a medium sized one uh, when you're at home where you can control the lighting. But of course, it's also very feasible and very common uh, to go just outside and maybe you have a cool rock face or even just some dusty ground or anything that you want to capture. So, of course, you need something to capture. Then, of course, you need some kind of camera. Uh, I, for myself, am using my good old trusty Canon um, 5D Mark III, but you don't have to have this, this huge DSLR, even a mobile phone works. Uh, if it has uh, some way of locking the exposure, uh, this would be very uh, helpful when stitching uh, things together. So if you got some kind of pro mode there that allows you to lock the exposure time and also the iris and uh, ISO, so pretty much everything just apart from the focus lockdown so that you can re yeah, reproduce uh, the model from seemingly uh, or similar not seemingly similar images with all the same settings and um, if you're using zoom lenses i will touch on this in the video just don't zoom just uh, stick to one uh, focal length and go with that uh, optionally when you are really serious about it um, you can use also one of those 
I uh, use this here. This is an X right color checker. And uh, uh, the reason for this is when you take a photo of it and the X right software uh, knows uh, how all the, the RGB values of those little squares are supposed to be and where your camera is off in certain ways. So, um, it has a software, I, I think I also mentioned this in the video, where just you take a picture in raw format, this is very important, in raw, and then it spits out when you do the processing uh, color profile. But we will do this uh, today. So this is very optional, but sometimes it's just nice for being able to set a good white balance to get the model as clean as possible. Because we want the model as clean as possible that we can put it in any kind of lighting situation in our game or whatever we are going to do. Okay, so enough with a preface to this. Let me try to switch over to full screen. Yes, it worked. Look at this. And here is this little photogrammetry pre-production uh, that I shot <laughs> all, not even an hour before. So yeah, let's hope that this works and I will monitor the chat because I can now lean back and uh, oh, one thing that I forgot to mention, whenever I say unicorn, have a sip of water, it's good to stay hydrated and I always forget to take my water <laughs> or enough water for the day. So this is our little drinky game. Cool. Oh, wrong one. There we go. <laughs> cool. Okay, so first we have to prepare the stage where we put our object that we want to recreate. And for me, it's going to be this pile of stones, which will be in the end a pile of rocks. I try not to make it as compact as possible, because the problems will be where there is the contact to the ground. See this one here, um, all those little holes there. So I'm trying to avoid those as best as I can. And the next thing is of course the camera to which to photograph it all. But before that, of course, we have to take care of the lighting. I'm using here now my trusty old LED lighting, but why am I pointing it at the ceiling? Uh, the reason for this is that it uh, causes very soft shadows. It's Oh yes, uh, regarding um, the lighting, you don't of course have to use an LED lighting, pretty much any kind of strong light source works, because if you're pointing it at the ceiling or getting it some other way of, of indirect lighting uh, of it, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a good lamp or a bad lamp, it's just as long as it's it's pretty stable in terms of lighting uh, strength and color, uh, it doesn't matter. If you bounce it off the walls, it's it, it, it will be very uh, diffuse anyway, so don't worry about that. Okay, um, continuing, wrong, wrong setup. As you can see here, um, actually we want to avoid any kind of shadows at all, but uh, if you can get the lighting to bounce off at least directly above what you want to photograph, you will only have the shadows down there. So this is not optimal, but since I'm going to turn this thing anyway, very carefully then when I'm uh, photographing, it, I hope it won't uh, be much of an issue. But this is something really to, to be aware of, that yeah, you try to want to avoid uh, casting any shadows onto your object. Okay, so how to photograph this thing? One important thing is um, when you're working with a zoom lens, uh, let me change here my view, um, is that you set it to a certain amount of uh, focal length. In my case I think I will be working with 17 millimeters or 50. Uh, yeah, just just uh, avoid zooming in and out. Uh, if you have a, a fixed lens that this would be best but I mean this this would work. Okay, so uh, because my lens is a little bit old I have to uh, stick it here in place uh, with this uh, tape here so that it doesn't change the focal length but I can still uh, pull the focus. Autofocus, yeah, I probably don't need it and stabilizer won't need it either. So uh, next thing that I'm going to do for calibration's sake is to get my trusty x right color checker. Uh, this is important if you really want to make sure that the colors are exactly the same because this one you can use here for calibration. This one comes here with a software where you can uh, input a raw image and say yeah this raw image has this color checker in there and it will put, uh, spit out a calibration uh, setting. 
So um, just to show you my settings, let's take a quick picture here. Where is the trigger? There we go. And it looks all right. It looks a bit too bright here on the camera, on uh, the camera I'm filming this with. But here it's okay. The important part or aspect of this is that it's sharp all the way from front to back. As sharp as you can get it. I'm not sure if it uh, reproduces here well, but in the background it's a little bit blurry already. And to, yeah, to avoid that it gets blurry is the reason is why I'm shooting this with a aperture of f11. Um, if you're not familiar with apertures and exposure settings, it just means um, um, the higher the number of the aperture is, the less light gets into uh, the lens in front here but uh, the image will be sharper in, in short terms. So um, this is why I'm uh, exposing for one and a half seconds because so little light is coming through here, but uh, the, the depth sharpness is as sharp as it can get from front to back. This is not so much an issue the bigger your objects are, and especially if you're photographing in direct sunlight, it's, it's really not that, that, that problematic. But for me, yeah, <laughs> I, I need to do things like this. Okay, so let's take off the color checker for now. I haven't photographed it, but I will do it in the end because I don't want to disturb this cute little pile there. So um, the photos that I'm taking is that I'm turning my object and not my camera. And the problem is that this will take a while because I always have this one and a half seconds of exposure time. But uh, yeah, try not to disturb it. Um, come to realize that it may have not been the best of ideas to use uh, something like this that's easily disturbed. It's just a pile of loose uh, rocks <laughs> or stones. And yeah, I'm just turning it ever so slightly. Okay, so I'm having here already a bit of a problem now that, <laughs> that the paper is not fully uh, able to rotate here, so I'll just move the camera a little bit back. By the way, it's it's not too problematic uh, if, you're, if you're moving the camera. Actually, this is what you want. You want to cover as many angles on, on the object in question as you can. Just um, don't disturb it. <laughs> so I hope this video is finished or at least uh, the, the taking of photographs is finished before the stream goes live because uh, I'm half an, I still got half an hour, so it's going to be interesting. I'm doing now one uh, turntable of this object here. Of course, the more angles you have, the better. Um, if you have the time and the software that allows you to import more images than I will have here, um, it's always best to have as many photos as you can get in the end. Okay. Having here the same problem again with, with my paper. So, yeah, I really hope that I'm not disturbing the stones here and everything was for naught. Like I said, it might be a little bit problematic now because um, it's such a small relatively small scale object and with the depth uh, information and the blurriness uh, into the image I might run into some problems but um, we, as we will see there are some settings to mitigate this at least a little bit so uh, if it were uh, this one here a clock face I would go in five minute steps or hour marks essentially uh, but yeah, like I said, the more angles you have, the better. So when I'm done with this, I will also take one photograph from the top and do some angles there, probably, as well. Also, what I didn't do is to make sure uh, <laughs> to mark uh, the, the spot where you started. It's not so much a problem if the object is straightforward, but this pile of rocks here, of stones, yeah, I'm not quite sh sure where I started. I think I started on the other side there. But, yeah, um, <laughs> I can't be sure. OK, 
Okay, and this should be the last one for this rotation. So let me check. Yeah, just, just one more, just to be sure. And then I'll do some additional coverage from a little bit higher, like so. Like I said, the more angles you can cover, the better. But those will be just, just a few. Just one from as high above or higher above as before. Something like this. And finally, of course, now that I'm done with it, I can safely destroy it, I hope. <laughs> and I will take a calibration image of this one. And with that, I'm pretty much done for um, pre producing. Uh, all the necessary photos, I hope, of these uh, stones. And here we are. Cool. Okay. I squashed my hair a bit. Thanks, headphones. Thank you so much. And at this point, I've taken out um, the card of the camera. And here are the photos. So let me just zoom in so you can see them. Yeah, they look pretty much as you would expect them to be. And the last one is the color checker. Um, everything is a CR2 file, which means uh, that's a proprietary RAW format, in this case of Canon. So um, the first thing uh, that I want to do is to turn them to DNGs. That's digital negative files. <laughs> Um, and there's uh, the DNG converter, which you can get from digital negative DNG. So that's what it stands for. The DNG converter, which you can get from Adobe for, I don't think it costs anything because of course they want, <laughs> they want you to use um, Lightroom and Photoshop down the line. So this is why they are pretty much giving it away for free. So I'm just saying that this is my inputs and my outputs go here, images, so it won't take long. Thank you so much, Thread Ripper. Output, and as for the settings, just so you can follow along, I'm using just the latest camera raw settings because uh, I will be using uh, Photoshop now or Adobe Bridge uh, to, to work on those uh, raw files. But uh, if you don't uh, have a Adobe subscription, because why would you have it if you got the option not to? Um, there's a program I recently discovered that is called this one here. It's called Raw Therapy uh, 5.8. What the hell is this? <laughs> And um, yeah, it also allows you to process raw images in, in some uh, regards. It's even better than Lightroom for once you can uh, even tweak which kind of algorithm you want to use for debayering the photos. Debayering, uh, that's a big topic by itself. In the end, it just means making a digital picture out of the raw camera data that you got. And oh, okay, yeah, of course we should start the raw conversion. And it says they're processing. So while I'm streaming, it's probably a little bit slower than before, but um, also probably because I'm streaming or not, I'm streaming, I'm copying from uh, the SD card reader. So it takes a little bit. And one downside to this whole thing is uh, that the next program that we're going to use uh, for these uh, processing these photos into a 3D object uh, is in its free version is limited to 50 uh, uh, images. So we will delete uh, or just skip uh, a few of them. So everything got converted. This is good. Exit there. So we won't need the camera images there. So everything should be in this images folder there. Let's close up this here not to be too distracting and yeah as expected everything is a DNG image and a little bit smaller as well which is good and the last one if you recall is um, 
the color checker. So the first thing that I need to do now that I have this color checker, of course, is just to show you this, this is the last image there, is to make, uh, to get a, a camera profile from, from this uh, thing here. You only have to do it once when you're in a certain lighting situation, so you don't have to do it each time uh, when nothing with the lighting changes and you're using even the same camera. But especially if you're using multiple cameras to photograph the same thing, um, having this kind of calibration tool is very helpful. Talking about the calibration tool, where do I have it? Um, there we go. It's called the Color Checker Passport because this thing is also called Color Checker Passport. A new version is there. Yeah, let's, let's skip it. And I haven't calibrated my screens in a long time, which is cool for us for, for now. So all you do pretty much is just uh, take the image with the uh, color checker on it, drop it there and it should find it by itself unless there's a lot of noise in the image, which you can of course use uh, um, adjust it manually like so where you can just um, drag here the endpoints around to where you need them. So just to make sure that the squares are always inside. Um, the squares yeah makes sense and then I just say create profile and it opens here automatically the camera profiles folder so I just call this um, photogrammetry test something like this and Adobe usually finds it in this folder here so profile has been created successfully I'm sorry for this erratic screen movement here for some reason this uh, app that I'm using to zoom in and out it's called glass brick and it's a little bit twitchy at times, so. And I'm not streaming at Twitch, obviously, <laughs> so um, that's not good. Okay, so we got our uh, uh, images as DNGs, and now we need to process them, ideally to be as flat, or not as flat, as uh, un- uh, uh, developed oh, that's also the wrong sense yeah we don't want any effects or kind of tweaking the contrast or highlights or anything we want it to be as is as much as is as possible uh, i'm going to start here photoshop i have it already prepared in the background and then i just um, drag in all those images that i have here i could also alternatively use lightroom and uh, then it should open the Adobe RAW processing uh, window, which is this one here. Um, or of course, you can use RAW therapy for this. Okay, just uh, to get the most important things uh, out first is um, we need the camera calibration. And I think, is it here? No, it's under treatment. It has it's probably under treatment profile, Adobe color. So I need to zoom out because I think, okay, now it works. Profile, browse, and there is my profiles folder. And there I have the photogrammetry test because I did also some others before. So uh, not a lot has changed there, but the next thing that I need to do is of course uh, do a white balance. And uh, lucky for me, there's still a little bit uh, of the x right color checker in the frame there. And the good thing is um, that if, let me just uh, show you there on the actual cam uh, x right color checker, the part that's visible, um, uh, you can see here the x right logo there. And uh, there we go. It's it's this, this white field here. So uh, this is a known color that is white. So I can use this there for uh, my white balance and white balance tool is this little thing here to just pick this one okay it doesn't work when i'm zoomed in so i just try it again and now it works so not a lot has changed again let's fit it in the view but this is how it should look like and just in comparison this is the next image there and we also can have a look at the histogram this just plots uh, all the values that are found in the image uh, right here is black and then it's just a ramp up to uh, complete white. So what shows me here is that the majority of pixels in this image are not uh, clipped, not over 256 in value or whatever it is, not over 100% white, so nothing is clipped. So this is pretty much ideal. And this is our image content there in the center. And those are some of the shadows that are here 
visible between the cracks and so on. So uh, yeah, this is pretty much everything that we need uh, in terms of processing the photos. So I'm just selecting all of them, not the color checker itself maybe. And oh yeah, just, just to make sure um, if I didn't have this color checker in frame here to, to do a white balance thing, you know what, let's do it properly. So I'm, I'm not starting there on the first image, I'm starting there on my color checker, set the profile to what I had before, that was uh, profiles photogrammetry, the color profile that we had before. So this sets the profile, I said done, oh, damn it. <laughs> so let, let's do this all again. The good thing is that uh, Adobe saves your settings in the raw file, in the DNG file itself. So where did we stop here? Okay, so this here got our correct color profile and all we need to do now is make a white balance with this tool here. So I'm just picking gray there and now everything got balanced. And now I can select everything and hit right click. And when I'm zoomed in, it doesn't show me the menu of the right click. So, but it says maybe, maybe, no, it doesn't work. When I'm zooming in, it it just uh, makes the <laughs> menu go away. So um, the thing that I want to say is sync settings. So you select the image that you've set up like, like we did here and then we sync it to all others. So make sure just everything is selected. All we need of course is just the profile and the white balance but yeah, I just, I just keep everything there. And then everything, all the photos should have the same settings that we just applied. So it's a bunch of very uninteresting photos and what we need to do now is to export them uh, that we can work with them in our next program which will take all those images and analyze them and see how they are related in space to each other and then construct a point cloud and further on a 3D model of this. So uh, yeah, we need to get uh, this out of those uh, DNG files. So you can use raw therapy now, but I'm I usually I use Lightroom, but Lightroom is acting very buggy when I'm streaming, so this is why I'm not doing it. And um, you know what? Let's let's try to open them all in Photoshop and then save them out, or we can even use Adobe Bridge or something. Uh, what's also important is we don't need all of them. Like I said, uh, the free version of the uh, 3D program that um, the 3D construction program that I'll be using uh, only allows at a maximum 50 photos, so just take out the first one. So, okay, now I'm trying to open this as images. Uh, one other thing to look out for is uh, here you can uh, specify when you open the photos in Photoshop and not raw therapy or any other app, it's important uh, that you import it with the highest color depth possible if you're really looking for highest quality. For my purposes, most of the time you don't need it, but sometimes like I had with some clients where it's very paramount to have the correct colors and a lot of information there as possible. This is why I'm using 16 bit, but um, the menu won't pop up of course. So I'm selecting here now this color space sRGB. Where do I have it? sRGB, no, it must be right there on top. sRGB and the color depth of eight bits per channel. This should be enough. And select all the photos that I want. Can I save them out from here? No, I just can, can open all the images, which is a little bit counterproductive now for us, but at least it gives us time to chat. So uh, I will have a look at the chat now and see how many people I've <laughs> I've scared away with all these this technicalities. What camera are you using, Phil, um, for shooting um, the the, uh, the photos of the um, stone pile or w w the camera I'm recording this now? And hi, Phil says Vitaly. Oh, hi, Vitaly. <laughs> okay, so I, maybe I have also answered the question uh, already, but again, I'm always using my trusty Canon 5D Mark III. Before that I had a Mark II and I'm pretty much in love with this camera because um, it's just so versatile. It shoots great, great photos, um, even with the lens, the, 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 the Canon uh, EF lens that came with it. It's a zoom lens from uh, 24 millimeters all the way up to 100, which is enough for most purposes. And what I really like about this camera is when you're out uh, uh, taking photos and usually for most of the purposes that you, you would 
take photos, a uh, phone is just enough. But when you really need to make a photo in a split second, uh, this baby, when I switch it on, it um, boots up in one and a half seconds and you can take a picture whenever you need to. And not this is always what <laughs> really <laughs> I hate about photographing with uh, phones is when you hit the trigger, it uh, delay sometimes up to one second and not in the moment that you would need it to. This is why I prefer this kind of camera. And of course it got a video mode, which is also great because um, you can, and this is the last important thing for me about this, this camera is there's a custom firmware which completely uh, overrides or replaces uh, the um, stock firmware in there. And man, it, it's, it's like this camera on steroids. You can shoot raw uh, video. So usually you would shoot um, um, H2 or MP, MP4 videos essentially, which of course are all ways compressed in, in one way or another. The cool thing about this custom firmware, which is called Magic Lantern, by the way, uh, there's, I think there's a firmwares for different brands of cameras now. But yeah, the cool thing is it lets you shoot raw images like photographs, but like 25 frames per second. The files are huge and you need to process them, but it looks like it's, it's really almost like a digital motion picture camera uh, from, from the quality of, of the camera chip there. Okay, so uh, enough about this one here. We are back at our beautiful stone pile. And now I'm going to save each and every one of those out. Oh boy. I should have really uh, uh, <laughs> um, thought of another way of doing this. I, I think I can automate it, but you know what? Uh, until I figure it out how to do this, um, I'm, I'm, I'm much faster if I just do this while I talk. So I just make a new folder there on my desktop. Let's call it um, for 3D, man, <laughs> I'm very, very unoriginal. And for now, it's, it's okay if I just save them out as JPEGs. Like I said, I won't be using or needing all the color fidelity of 16-bit TIFF images because the downside of this is, of course, that it takes a lot of time to process and also um, a lot of space on the hard drive. And I, for myself, usually have my projects that I'm working on, unless they're the big video projects. I have them in my Dropbox. And yeah, it's not fun if the Dropbox needs to sync like 30 gigabytes of videos whenever you're uh, <laughs> away. So yeah, this is, I've apparently I've selected or elected the worst approach of doing this. Sh I should have done this with prior to, to, to streaming this with uh, Lightroom. So um, yeah, unicorn, by the way, let's have a sip of water. And yeah, let's let's chat about, <laughs> oh, already saved this one. Let's chat about anything while I'm saving out uh, around 50, oh, I already have this one. While I'm saving out 50 of those images there. So, okay, if I just close it, it asks me to save it and then I can, oh, then it wants me to save as a Photoshop file. This is not good, yeah. So in short, you want <laughs> you want to do this uh, in some kind of batch capable software, for example, Adobe Lightroom or um, uh, what's it called? Raw Therapy with double E at the end. What does it have? Can you use f uh, photometry to add anything to the game like actual people cars? Um, yes, to a certain degree. As you can see here with uh, the photogrammetry solution that I have here, um, you're pretty much restricted to anything that doesn't move and where also the lighting situation doesn't change much while you're moving around it or taking photos. And the other thing is uh, that it's not a smooth reflective surface. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what you cannot uh, properly uh, photograph in a way that you can reconstruct it later. For one thing is anything with transparencies because uh, the algorithms later, they can't decide what is a transparent pixel, what is behind it, what is the surface itself. So uh, transparencies are a no-no. 
And the other thing that you can't do, of course, is anything that's highly reflective or even reflective at all. Even if you have something that's just plastic, uh, but uh, it reflects a light source there and this is just a white dot. And of course you turn it and the white dot is somewhere else because it's a reflection and not part of the model itself. It's harder for the algorithm of uh, pretty much any software to construct a, a proper 3D model. In, in essentially, you're just introducing noise uh, that makes uh, the result harder to be accurate. So this is another thing you can't do. So this pretty much says uh, outright impossible to do cars because uh, they're pretty much all <laughs> glass and reflective surfaces, well, maybe apart from the tires, uh, excuse me. But um, you could do model cars and there's also um, a trick that you can use to, to get this reflectiveness off that is using hairspray or just any, uh, any kind of matting spray that you just spray on top and then it essentially just uh, um, roughens up the surface that it doesn't, isn't as reflective or yeah, as before. This also works just to a certain degree. And the other thing um, with people, yes, it is possible to capture people, but um, f because people are constantly moving, even if you tell them to just freeze and, and not move, <laughs> uh, they need to breathe. So even if they hold their breath, have you tried keeping your hand uh, still uh, up in the air for like 15 seconds and then realize that you've slumped down ever so slightly? Yeah, again, this all introduces noise when you try um, to yeah, capture people. But there are solutions to this, obviously, as always Hollywood and <laughs> and all the big VFX shops uh, for those that need it. Um, there are some certain ways to do this. For one thing, there are some kind of um, stages in a sense where you just uh, it's just this big white ball where you step into. The thing is, it's, it's white <laughs> because it's illuminated from all around you. So the lighting is very, very soft, very flat and very... Um, uh, homogeneous from all sides and the thing about this is there are cameras and not just two or three but like 60 cameras from all angles so you, that all that you can trigger all at the same time so essentially this makes it possible to uh, capture entire people or pretty much anything that's moving uh, which you, you can't otherwise accurately capture but of course this thing is not something you have uh, at home or can even uh, get <laughs> Uh, at, at, a, at a reasonable price anywhere. So I think there are some services where you can hire someone to come to your facility and do some capturing. And uh, yeah, in, in short, it's not really possible. So most of the time you're faster, especially when, you, when it uh, turns uh, to some kind of characters that you want to iterate over. It's if you have a talented modeler that is capable of yeah, doing humans or even working from some kind of preset model and then just changing it up to, to match uh, the character that you want, I, it's, I think it's almost easier and faster. Because the other thing that we will see with photogrammetry is you can't easily change things. For example, um, if I were to uh, photogrammatically, is this the right term? <laughs> um, to uh, photograph, let's say, um, a book or something, which is just a big rectangle. Um, it won't be perfect uh, because even if the surface is pretty flat in the end, it will still be a little bit bumpy because of all the noise in the photographs and of the algorithm and whatever whatever is going on. I mean, it looks flat from, say, 10 feet away. <laughs> but uh, when you come closer, it just it has millions of polygons for just a simple thing as a book, which is just a big rectangle, maybe with the spine or something. So in the end, uh, if you want to change something, you have to reduce the polygons sensibly somewhere or somehow. And this is also a huge uh, labor intense step. And in the end, most of the time where I use uh, photogrammetry, when I need to have a model that I need to reproduce perfectly or very close uh, to perfection at a very high detail level, my uh, use is that I try to photogrammatically get the model into my 3D software and then use this pretty much as a, um, yeah, as a template, as a reference where I can just, I'm not using any of the polygons, but I can just handle myself along. No, that's not 
not the right word, Hengel myself along. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm using Germanisms now, <laughs> where I can use the polygons essentially as a guide and then draw my perfect uh, shapes from them. The upside is, like I said before, it's in the end, it's, a, it's faster because you don't have to do all those cleanups and you can, because your process is pretty much uh, straightforward and box modeling or whatever you're going to use, uh, it's, it's easy to introduce changes to this. Okay, so am I making any progress on those stones here? <laughs> at least, at least a little bit. Yeah, this is not my, not my uh, best moment doing doing stuff uh, that computers are best for. That is batch processing and doing it all myself. <laughs> okay, let's have another look at the chat. Do you plan to apply this technique for one of your upcoming games, or is it more like tinkering with stuff? Um, it started as tinkering with stuff. But um, like I said, um, I'm also doing visual effects and motion graphics jobs uh, al alongside my videos. And for the last job, I, like I said, I needed to do, the, to do it because I had a very tricky surface, which I couldn't uh, uh, sensibly recreate myself, just eyeing essentially it where, where it needs to go. So I just uh, took this one surface and recreated it and the rest was, was uh, traditional box modeling and for for games like i said the, the downside is that those models usually have a huge load of polygons but with other tools like zbrush or even maya built-in stuff i think it's it's possible to sensibly reduce the polygons up to a level where that you can use them and uh, for myself i'm always capturing stuff ever since I was uh, uh, first learned how textures or how 3D models are made. So essentially I've been running around capturing textures for, I don't know, 30, almost, no, it's not 30 years, but, but close to, it's at least 25 years <laughs> that I've been running around with cameras back then, uh, analog cameras, and was just taking pictures of walls and stuff. Uh, and um, since I've learned how photogrammetry works when I'm on vacation somewhere, for example, I was, uh, I went to Spain a couple of years ago and um, even when I didn't have a lot of time, I just, for, 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 for some very interesting rock formations, I just walked around it and, and took some photos for maybe to, uh, to, to use in a game or a video or anything else. Essentially, I'm, I'm just having fun building up a library for myself. So the answer is yes this thing might actually show up in a game or, or or an other product of mine. And even if not, hey, maybe you need a stone pile. Someone needs a stone pile. But we're, we're not done yet, so I, I can't tell how well this is going to work <laughs> in the end because um, this actually is a problematic uh, uh, model in a sense because it got lots of little holes there where it's not quite clear where something is touching the ground and I'm... I'm also restricted to not having a lot of photos because you, like I said, you need to, if you have a hundred of in 20 photos of, of this <laughs> boring uh, thing uh, from, from different angles, this, this would uh, be much better than having just 50. So I think the problems that we will be seeing is where those stones are actually in contact uh, with the ground, where it's not quite clear where it really sits. So should we be using this in a game later on and I already prepared a unity scene for us, we might have to uh, stick it a little further in the ground than it is here on the plane. Okay, almost done. Jesus, <laughs> this was, like I said, not my finest hour, but, but at least we're done. I hope. So where did I save it? Oh, I've saved it here. But at least now we can discern between JPEG images and DNG files. So everything here is a JPEG and let's move it to 4.3D and that's that. Um, what you've also noticed of course is that I was using a white background there because you want to minimize any kind of background when you're shooting. This is of course very easy when you do this at home like I did because with a just big enough white carton you can uh, il il illuminate eliminate uh, any kind of, of unwanted background. But sometimes, uh, especially when you're out in the field photographing, let's say a stem of a tree, of course you got something uh, behind it and you need to mask what you want and what you don't want. But this is where we are getting to next. 
Okay, so I got all my images as JPEGs now. And it's how many is it? It's 56. So um, I probably can take out the first couple of one. Let's take out three here and just three some that look similar one, two, uh, and three here. I don't know. So this is just eyeballing it, <laughs> what I will need or not. Okay, which software are we using now? And uh, the one that I rea realized that I stumbled upon was 3DF Zephyr, Zephyr, I have no idea how it's pronounced, Zephyr, let's call it Zephyr. 3DF Zephyr, and there's a free version, and this is what you can use. Um, there are uh, open source alternatives. I want to show you another one. Uh, just really quickly, which is called, what's it called? Where do I have it? I have way too many icons there. <laughs> it's called Mesh Room, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, it's called Mesh Room and it's surprisingly uh, good, <laughs> especially for something that's uh, it's open source. And it looks like this and it doesn't cost anything. It's from Ellis Vision, just to show you here, it's called Mesh Room and the current version is 2019. Uh, 2.0. It's a little bit harder to use, of course, as, as with all <laughs> stuff that is free, but it also produces good results. Uh, the downside to this is it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of hard disk space because internally it converts everything to EXR images, which are 32-bit images. So yeah, it takes long and sometimes it flat out doesn't work and you can't really tweak it or not a, a, as, as much as you can tweak uh, the end result there uh, in Cipher as we can see now. Okay, so thank you for joining. Yeah, not, not right now, thank you. So the workflow is, is this. First we import our photographs, then Cipher will yeah, just analyze the photographs and put them into a spatial relation to each other and construct a point cloud uh, where everything that matches, every feature that matches in one photo matches also in other photo and then it can triangulate actually the position of this pixel in space. And from this it creates a cloud in 3D that's made up of points and from these points it will connect them and create a mesh, a 3D mesh, uh, a colored one and in the end it will even project the textures onto everything. So I hope this makes sense and everything of this will take time, but I will walk you through one by one that you can easily follow along, I hope. <laughs> okay, so what I do now is just grab all my images and drop them here. And it says, wow, new project, what shall we do? So I say now, let's compute a, three, a 3D model after the project creation and we want to uh, compute the textures right now. And I will show you what mask images is. Like I said, this is when you have some kind of background that you don't want in your images. Just to show you uh, how this works, because the first time that I wanted to use this, I did things wrong and then nothing worked. And then the model didn't uh, be created because I masked out what I wanted to have as the back. In short, I show you how it's done. <laughs> and how not to do things. Okay, so here you can import the pictures because I just dragged and dropped them. This is all the pictures that I have there. Next, and here we are with masking and it says there is a no mask found for any of those pictures. And there's a cool tool that comes with a cipher that is called Masquerade. And you can guess what Masquerade is used for. Um, oh yeah, it says here, if you're running Masquerade in the free version, of course, you can't save it in any other format than to use with Cipher, which is fine for me because I'm not going to use it for anything else. So this is how Masquerade looks. The important thing is that you got here all the photos and on the bottom, those are the important buttons that you need to familiarize yourself with. In the end, it's, it's very simple. You just pick um, the, the red uh, silhouette, uh, brush there where you just uh, roughly draw yeah this is all foreground here everything this is foreground and then you pick the blue brush and say yeah around this here everything around this here is supposed to be background yeah 
yeah i I hope this works uh, i think there will be some problems there with uh, this kinds of of yeah a very dark dark places and once you're done you hit this beautiful where where am i there we go this beautiful um magic wand tool so i zoom out that you can see what happens now and there everything that's red is meant to be kept and everything that's not red is ignored when uh, the pictures are getting processed so of course this is not perfect so i will add a little bit here a little bit here and this one here so essentially you just want to follow the silhouette the outline of everything uh, on the inside with red and on the outside with blue and then do things again so it's it's a little bit better but but still worse <laughs> well not worse but yeah for us, uh, since this is on a white background, it's not really very usable. But you can do this for each and every single one of those pictures. Uh, the good thing is if you hit enter, then it uh, for, for the next images in the sequence, it tries, uh, it, it estimates that a thing is probably rotated and yeah, it pretty much estimates uh, all the points uh, for the next image there to make masking a little bit easier. But you can see it's it's a lot of it's a lot of time and not not that that fun. <laughs> so um, this I, I just wanted to show you how 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 to work with this. And of course, if you have for example like I have here a white background, but maybe in the in the background of this white uh, carton there is something that I don't need. For example. Uh, stuff in my room or so it's much faster if you select here the, the polygon lasso tool and just say yeah i'm just selecting this one here and everything in this here is foreground so i just do a double click when i'm finished and this is where i got things wrong I, you afterwards you have to hit the plus or minus button otherwise it's just an in selection that will go away and if you of course if you selected something that you don't want you just select it again and hit minus and this is this is how it works and then you hit control s save and go to the next image which we won't do oh, i'm sorry which we won't do because like i said before everything is shot on a white background so i can discard everything so i'm step back now and disable mask images because my images in this case don't need to be masked but i just wanted to show you um yeah <laughs> uh, how how this uh, works maybe you you need it okay the next thing is because i shot it raw and kept all the camera data in there even in the jpegs that i saved out of photoshop everything in terms of camera calibration is in there it says yeah this was shot with a canon 5d and with uh, 70 millimeters and this is pretty much perfect because uh, why does the program need to use this or need to know uh, the lens it's important for uh, like I said, the 3D uh, uh, triangulation of all the pixels, because uh, the more you, it knows about the environment and the camera itself, uh, the, the better the results will be. So this is why I said before, don't zoom in and zoom out. Uh, I think this program might handle it correctly, but for example, mesh room, I think it won't. So this is always use a prime lens or just don't, don't tinker with it. Okay, finally, next. So what do we want here with the project wizard? So this is very straightforward. So for now, I say just that it finishes within today while I'm streaming. So we say the matching type should be fast. The matching stage depth should be high. Global incremental photo ordering. Oh yeah, this is maybe interesting. If your photos are strictly just a turntable, you can say sequential or circular. I say approximative grid, as it says, when images are known to be in a specific order, you can set this value to sequential ordering, circular ordering, or approximate grid. Set the value to unordered if the image ordering is unknown. Just to, yeah, just make, make sure that in my case, I say it's unordered so that it pretty much has to decide from itself uh, from which angle I shot uh, the photo. Okay, stereo settings page, number of nearest cameras. Uh, this is also just something uh, how uh, to reconstruct uh, the image, uh, the, the 3D model from the image, if you have uh, stereo settings or something, but I don't have any, so I just keep it as is. And of course you can say here the mesh creation, how smooth you want the mesh. Uh, it will be of course filtered because of all the noise that there is and there's a, also a value for water tightness because most of the time you will have some kind of holes in there but we can uh, also take care of this later so for now i just keep pretty much uh, um, here by the way you can have the settings here in presets which 
it usually comes with advanced where you have those nice sliders and of course custom where you can pretty much say everything uh, or set anything that the program offers. Okay, so maximum vertices uh, that uh, I think we should be with 10 million vertices, we should be fine. Oh, sorry, I just, yeah, like this and next. And again, this is just a summary and let's run it. And this is the part that I enjoy most is having my computer plot these wonderful graphs here. And it shows me here the, the graph of the CPU total, the physics memory, uh, the physical memory occupied, and of course my graphics card, because uh, this program apparently, uh, this software is pretty uh, well uh, programmed that it also utilizes your GPU and CPU uh, concurrently. Okay, so let's have a look at the chat and see if anyone is still following me or I'm just talking into the void. Um, hey, I made this. Uh, hey, I made it. This is good. Oh, hey, hey, Frost Silent. I'm, I'm sorry for being not able to read five words correctly and not, not, not even hard words. Phil, just curious. Do you know any examples of AAA games that have implemented photogrammetry to model stuff? Uh, yes. For example, I think a lot of them have a Battlefront. Pretty much all the environments you see in those big open world. I think even Ubisoft uses photogrammetry. But for Battlefront, I'm uh, I know it for a fact that they. Uh, traveled to, um, I think, was, was it also Iceland? No, this was something else. Yeah, but they traveled to all those locations, uh, the desert and some some uh, ice locations, for lack of a better term, ice locations, <laughs> for mountains. Uh, and uh, they um, there is a GDC talk actually on, on how they captured all those uh, things. Because you really need to have a plan on what to shoot and when to shoot it, because you can't shoot in direct sunlight, because then you will have harsh shadows. And this is also something I want to touch on later. You need to get rid of all the lighting in the model because the lighting will happen in your game or if you're doing visual effects in the rendering software in the end. So you want to have the model as clean and as yeah as clean of any uh, environmental influences that were present when we are capturing it to use it for your own needs in a sinister term. Yeah, but uh, Battlefront uses it, I think, um, I'm, I'm certain it um, Death Stranding, all those beautiful environments are uh, photogrammatically captured. Not a triple A game, but uh, the vanishing of Ethan Carter. I think this was the first poster child of, yeah, photogrammetry has arrived even for games. And um, these are just a few that I can think of uh, off the top of my head. But if you just uh, search for it and just dig a little bit into it, you will notice that I think a, a lot of, of games now uh, have models that were done with photogrammetry. Um, the, the thing is right now it's possible because uh, in the last five to six years, it's possible to use uh, models that were created through photogrammetry because before that um, you really had to be very conservative of your polygon count. And like I said, usually a model that, that comes straight out, out of photo photogrammetry without any processing or mesh reduction algorithms, it's uh, I think a couple of million polygons. So you can either have a complete level that's hand modeled with a polygon budget in mind, or you can have one model that comes out of your photogrammetry software. But in visual effects for movies and films, I think it goes back even to the mid uh, noughties, around 2005 or so. I think I, I attended a conference in 2008 where it was already uh, a topic there. And the good thing is that of course the software has developed and it's not just those proprietary software tools or just some very specialized uh, providers that uh, charge you like $30,000 for their software because nobody else can do it. Like I said, with Meshroom, there's a open source alternative. Is it open source or if, is it just freeware? I'm, I'm right now, I'm not sure. But at least you, you got options nowadays. And with uh, 3DF Zephyr, I think this is so far my favorite tool as of now because of all the things you can uh, manipulate your mesh with once it has been uh, created, which we'll see in a bit. Uh, long answer. Vitaly <laughs> um, Lee Talos principle is, is one example. Oh yeah, right, the Talos principle. So pretty much anything <laughs> in my opinion where you have those, those uh, rock faces and uh, yeah, environment that's, that's not overly uh, technical or, or clean, pretty much anything benefits from doing uh, photogrammetry. 
yeah, things that you can't do with photogrammetry, I've touched on before, but uh, in terms of uh, environments, what's really hard is trees. You can do photogrammetry of the tree trunks or just tree stumps, that's, that's very common, <laughs> or even the twigs themselves. But as soon as you have uh, surfaces that are very thin, such as leaves or even needles from pine trees or so, um, you can't really do them. Uh, same thing for, for blades of grass, unless you're really doing macro photography and then you blade, one blade of grass has like uh, 12,000 polygons, which is of course not feasible. So all these things you can't really do with photogrammetry. But of course you can mix um, a tree trunk that you recreated through photogrammetry and then of course add some twigs with leaves that were modeled traditionally. And of course you don't have to paint the leaves themselves, you can also capture them uh, on location, you just rip them off a plant and then put it on a white background or an orange one because that's the opposite color of, of green. So you can um, do an orange key instead of a green key, <laughs> green screen key, just to get the, 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 the information of the leaves or pretty much any plant. I think this is also how they did the environments for Battlefront. Um, they just uh, identified what uh, kind of um, props they would need for each uh, stage. For example, yeah, we need a tree trunk or uh, five different tree trunks. We need five different rocks that you can rotate and scale that it always looks like a different rock. We need uh, five different ground uh, tiles. And then of course we need uh, uh, three of those plants, three plants of those and three plants of those. And this is, you have to do this before, of course, because otherwise you just go back and forth to the location because you always realize, huh, it's, it's still missing this one plant or, or something. <laughs> so um, it's always good to have a plan. And also when you want to go out uh, to do some photogrammetry uh, capturing, like I said, the best uh, weather is fog almo or almost fog when it's, it's very overcast. So the light is coming pretty much from all directions at, at the same intensity. This is what you want. Uh, but of course, uh, the darker it is, um, the more prone you are to that the, the shots turn out a little bit shaky or you, it's very noisy when you turn up um, the ISO settings. So yeah, it's, it's always a back and forth at, at the camera settings. So if you are familiar with your camera and know a little bit about photography, it will help you down the line. And all, it always helps to bring a tripod <laughs> and maybe even a fisheye lens. But this is a huge topic by itself because maybe you want to shoot an HDRI panorama shot of uh, the model that you shoot. Because I think I still got some time to explain this. Uh, as I said before, you want to uh, get out the original environment uh, or traces of the original environment where something was shot. And even if, for example, you have a cliff and um, of course, it's, it's not uh, floating in thin air. When you photograph it, it's a cliff face or a rock face. And then of course it has a ground, it's grounded. And then on top, it's not. Even if it's overcast, uh, the bottom part will be darker thanks to ambient occlusion, or uh, I think it's ambient occlusion, we, we still call it. Yeah, um, which essentially says, yeah, of course, on the ground there, sunlight can only come from the top or around the horizon, but of course from, from the ground, it will only bounce back the light, so it is darker. What you want to do is, in your model, you don't want to have this kind of grounding there, especially if you want to use it in different uh, angles. So you need to get out the shadows. The shadows you get out by taking photos in only overcast skies, that I said. But um, getting out the ambient occlusion, even if it's the model is uh, occluding itself, for example, like we have here, uh, in in those little <laughs> stones, um, they are occluding themselves here. I mean, of course, uh, this is darker in there. This this part here is darker because it casts a shadow from this uh, stone there. So, yeah, but how do you get this out? And you have to do something that is called de-lighting. And essentially, it's uh, capturing or knowing in what environment you captured uh, a model. And you do this by shooting an HDR panorama of the spot of where the model is sitting. This means with fisheye lenses, you just yeah have a 360 uh, panoramic shot, but it's not just one photo, it's an HDR photo, which means high dynamic range. So um, 
you do uh, you photograph it in one exposure setting where everything looks right then you underexpose it intentionally shoot everything again and underexpose it uh, the reason for this is bright light sources for example the sun or even uh, uh, just reflections or something everything gets gets captured there because uh, otherwise um, the because if you don't shoot it as this HDRI high dynamic range image the problem is uh, we, we all notice when we shoot or photograph something indoors and outside through the window you can see uh, usually uh, the environment but it's just completely white completely blown out completely clipped and if you shoot it in HDRI, um, it is retained what is out there. Because otherwise, uh, if you do this uh, digital delighting, um, the computer won't know uh, when uh, the values were clipped. When it's just 100% white, the sky, for example, it doesn't know if, if there are clouds there, is there a sun from where the light direction is coming, and so on. I think, uh, man, this is very technical right now, what I'm, what I'm saying. But the reason is this, that you can use this digital... Uh, environment essentially and put in your uh, object that you recreated with all its ambient occlusion and then you pretty much recreate the ambient occlusion digitally which should be perfect or matching the real one and then you can subtract it from the image values this is the short version of, of how it works there are tools out there i think from agsoft that's agi software's something that's called a delighter i think it's it's fr is from this software which essentially does this but it also means yeah you're taking a lot of pictures right now right <laughs> you're, you're photographing uh, hundreds of pictures from from the thing you want to digitally re recreate and then of course you shoot uh, like 50 pictures uh, for this uh, hdri panoramic shot for any model that's at a different place, uh, of course, uh, uh, than, than the one panorama is, because you want it to get uh, uh, perfect. So yeah, this is why this is a lot of work. And uh, the good thing is that there are now enough tools to make our life a little bit easier. <laughs> so um, let's see here, the calculating regions, we're almost done there with the depth map, it tells me, and I hope even the stream didn't didn't uh, uh, get all choppy while this is going on, because let's have a look at the task manager there. Because yeah, the CPU is pretty much <laughs> entirely occupied with just uh, doing this uh, recreation. So you can see I'm um, even on my Threadripper with like 24 cores. It takes a long time. It takes a long time. Uh, Frost Silent is back. The process is making me dizzy. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> but uh, as you have probably know, I have a fascination with anything that's uh, 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 like this photography and VFX and 3D and so on. So yeah, I, I looked into this uh, very much also because uh, I have a background in visual effects for film and movie. And so I spend a lot of time getting getting to know all those workflows. And man, there's so much interesting stuff out there. For example, when you're doing movies like Iron Man, um, I've heard this talk at also at a conference uh, where, of course, his suit is oftentimes digital, but of course you need to have the reflections of the room as he's moving through. So you can, like I said, make a panoramic shot, a uh, uh, panorama, but it's only from one spot in this room. So when he's walking through it, but the, you get the reflections from this digital panorama, um, they don't match up. For example, if someone's standing next to a table, it doesn't get reflected there. So what they did was take multiple um, panoramic shots in the scene that should play out and then rebuild the scene, just very blocky, and then reproject those panoramas outwards from where they were uh, photographed. Essentially, it's just like a huge explosion that goes outwards and colors all the textures, this entire digital set. And through this digital set, then uh, they puppeteer uh, the, the um, Iron Man suit. And when the suit is moving in, in the scene, let's say next to a table, it always gets the correct reflection, which I think is genius. But of course, it's a lot of work. But in the end, I mean, yeah, visual effects and also with games in the end, there are some things where I just uh, think, yeah, I know it will be a lot of work, but you know what? Let's go for it. The result will be just amazing. 
At least <laughs> this is my way of doing things. By the way, unicorn and cheers. Ah, marvelous. Okay, let's have a closer look at, okay, I can't zoom in anymore. Why can't I zoom in? Let's have a look here at my glass brick and it's not working anymore. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I, I try to restart now this uh, glass brick app. This is the one that lets me zoom into and out of my desktop, if it works. But it doesn't seem to work anymore. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know what? I can close now mesh room that we have still in the background. I think uh, the few other Iron Man films are fully digitized with Donnie only wearing a chest plate of the suit he wears. Yeah, <laughs> I've noticed that for some reason cinema has gone quite a, a stretch where it's in the end it's just 90% digital because um, I know it from, from my experience uh, that people want to change things, especially people in charge want to keep all their options open as long as possible. This is why there is my main job, digital color grading. Most of the times you want to change, maybe maybe change the, the, the feeling of this from warm to, to cool, something like this. But then, of course, there's uh, movies like <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog, <laughs> where, yeah, they needed to change pretty much everything because the director or anyone who uh, didn't really know what they wanted went for this horrible thing. Oh, good. Now, now we already got the sparse point cloud, but now things should uh, uh, get a little bit quicker now, because now we're moving, um, now we're computing the mesh, and fingers crossed, I hope nothing crashes now, that we are this close to seeing uh, how bad or how well I shot uh, the photos of my little stone pile. Please don't remind me of the first Sonic trailer. I won't remind you of the first Sonic trailer because your nightmares will remind you of it for the end of your life. Again, I tried to zoom in, but it didn't work. And I think uh, the problem was that once I started the um, task manager, I think this is what, what broke um, Glassbrick. Or maybe it was OBS. At least since <laughs> I've got so many apps open, uh, oh, okay, okay, I restarted, now it, it works again, so cool. Because I wanted to show you um, what we're already at, and it's computing the photo consistency and the photometric gradient. I once looked it up what this meant, and because I wanted to appear very smart and very knowledgeable to, and tell you, because I'm this incredibly smart person that knows everything, and I completely forgot what it does. Sorry. <laughs> But hey, look at this, at least my CPU is getting some workout as well as my GeForce. This is good. But don't you love those kind of error logs or at least logs that just tell you any tiny little thing that's going on? I really like this. I pre prefer this myself much more than just a text that says working on it and this little donut of death because you don't know where the computer actually is right now, what's going on, with what it is having problems or not. And at this, with this, uh, it, at least I know when something goes wrong, where it went wrong, and maybe I can, I don't know, change the image that's, that's giving it troubles, or I don't know, just be able to do something about it. Okay, we're here at a stage, or I think it was, yeah, is it stage, stage eight of, or even nine of 20. So uh, yeah, there is this relative error, which we want to keep as low as possible. This is how close the photos are overlapping each other, how the features are matching up to where they are uh, in the other photos or essentially where um, the, the software expect the feature to show up. And if it's a little bit off by a certain percentage or in this case, error value, um, the further of course it is off the, um, the quality in the end will suffer. But I think if it's under 0 0.1, we're pretty good. I mean, look at this 0 0.04, this is, this is okay. 
And again, this comes down to how well um, the camera metadata uh, was retained. So got a lot of groups there and now it's computing colors, which means uh, we are not going to see a textured version, but it will look like a textured version because it's using vertex colors. A vertex, if you re remember, a polygon is made up of multiple vertices that are just the points where the polygon edges al run along and each vertex can have a color which bleeds into this uh, polygon. So it's just a color for a vertex. And look at this, we're here done and it says reconstructed, yes, 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 yes. This is good because um, sometimes when the algorithm can't match where a photo uh, was uh, yeah, in, in the environment where it can't really estimate the position or recreate or calculate the position of the camera where a photo was taken, the photo itself is rejected from, from the final um, result, which means yeah, your quality and your fidelity suffers. Okay, finally, look at this. Finally, we have here something and I don't know what's going on there on the ground, but I think this is uh, the shadows. But okay, now is the time of truth. I make this full screen and now let's turn the camera and look at this, look at this. It's almost good. It's almost good. It's of course, it's not entire, entire, entirely good, but at least workable depends on how big you want to use it in your game in the end. If this is your level <laughs> and your character is jumping from one rock to the next, for example, this might work. But then when we look at some of the edges, for example here, yeah, they are really sharp and cragged and not ideal, but uh, at least as good as it gets. You can see here, there we have some kind of artifact there. This is something that we would need to clean up later on. So uh, I'm rather um, happy with the result. But then of course you can see there where there are uh, some kind of holes between uh, the, the stones. It didn't know what to do with it and just filled it out. It's not too bad, but it's at least it's noticeable. But overall I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy with how this turned out. Okay, so uh, our next stages will be cleaning this up or at least making it a little bit less. <laughs> less uh, 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 cragged and, and, and yeah, well, sorry. We want to make it look a little bit better, get rid of this white ground plate there, maybe do some uh, mesh reduction and then see uh, uh, how it looks inside a Unity project. Something happened in the chat, detailed logs, <laughs> a two picture turn 3D, yes. Uh, und Opapi says, jo, ein bisschen spät, aber immer nicht komplett den Stream verpasst. Willkommen Opapi. Uh, Maybe I should, shouldn't switch to German <laughs> because <laughs> I, I almost forgot to switch back to English. Okay, so this is how our beautiful pile of rocks looked like. I think the problem with this one here being not entirely correct is that um, when I was turning the paper, some of the rocks moved ever so slightly or stones, it's not rocks, but they appear like rocks now. So maybe this is the reason why it's not 100% it's not perfect. Yeah, I think this is also the reason why it's a little bit jagged here and also the texture won't uh, be too good. Another thing that we can see here, of course, is uh, that this little um, noisy floor, where does this come from? Yeah, this is the shadows. And because I was turning um, the, the paper on which I photographed uh, the stones and not uh, didn't uh, walk with the camera around them, uh, the upside was that uh, the lighting got a little bit uh, more even overall, but the downside is it produced a lot of artifacts there uh, and you can see it clearly on the ground. Another thing that you can see what I was talking about the noise factor is, let's uh, switch to um, wireframe mode, is the, the ground uh, should be entirely flat. And when I go closer, of course, you can see that it is not. And this is a big problem when you try to uh, recreate or, or photogrammatically recreate smooth 100% flat surfaces like, for example, a book or something. So this is always something to look out for. But uh, when you're doing stones or rocks or any organic forms, uh, this won't matter much because, you, yeah, of course, you, you can't really tell if, a, if it's that smooth or not because the stone overall is, is not smooth. Okay, so let's clean this up. 
as much as we can and then uh, try to create a texture, do some more cleanups maybe in Maya and see it in action in Unity. Okay, what is good already is that this thing here is grounded. Oh, oh another thing that's, that's uh, interesting here, I'm not quite sure if you can see it, let's zoom in. Those little blue things here, those are the calculated camera positions uh, uh, in relation to this model. So you can see here, I shot this one ring here when the camera was on the tripod and then the other one was uh, uh, on top. And this final thing here, um, oh, sorry, wrong here. This was the very last image that I shot almost directly from top. So this is good. And what also is good is that, of course, it's uh, rotated correctly. Because sometimes, especially when you photograph something that uh, doesn't have this kind of ground plate, oh my God, what, what did I do? What did I do? Redo, okay. Because I just undid <laughs> the mesh creation, which is bad. Because sometimes you get something that looks like this, and then of course you have to rotate it that it sits in center of the world and also flat on the ground. This is good. So I just say here cancel because it was good before. The next thing is we want to get rid of this white ground plate because we don't really need it. All we care about is this pile of rocks and not this white ground which we can't use. For this we got here tools and a lot of mesh filters and mesh tools. Mesh filters are here very, very helpful. And what I'm going to do is now cut with a plane. So this is, is pretty much essentially what it says it does. You can cut everything um, on a plane. And the plane, as you can see here, our model is not perfectly flat, as is now uh, very obvious here when, when we move the plane around. So you know what? I just say cancel and then rotate our object just a little bit hopefully just a bit in the hopes that it's it's more flat or more planar than before so let's try this again tools mesh filters a cut with plane this looks looks better okay let's you know what let's go with this and i just scale the plane up and make it a little bit I want to retain as much information of our model as possible while of course getting rid of as much of the ground plane as possible. This was not good. And yeah, it's still a little bit wobbly. So I'm still rotating it just a bit, just a bit, yeah, like this. And you always have to say apply or okay and then select another tool. Otherwise it will complain that there's still a tool open. Please finish editing first, which will probably hop happen with me because I'm easy <laughs> to forget it. So um, cut with plane, bounding plane. Okay, so now whatever it's going to be, let's go with it. So um, everything that still pokes through will remain, but we can get, get rid of all those little artifacts later. For now, I just say, okay. And now it really goes through uh, creating the mesh again. I hope it won't take too long now, but sometimes I had this strange bug where it only worked when I, <laughs> for some reason, was clicking this uh, window and moving it around. Only then would the log update. I don't know why or what reason would be behind that this happens, but yeah, this is how things sometimes go. I think this was even present with Windows 95 that things would go faster if you were moving them with a mouse because the window uh, would, or the, the program whose window you were moving around would get updated more often and then get more CPU time and processes would finish faster. Okay, so what, what did happen? Why don't we see anything? Well, there here, to the side, there you can select which mesh to display. And of course, now that it's cut, I can just display this one mesh or just what we cut. So I'm on only interested in this mesh one cut and the result, so this looks already pretty nice. So now how to get rid of all this um, <laughs> gunk, for lack of a better term, <laughs> that surrounds it, um, we can select it. And there we got some tools there for selection. And you can say select by color, select by plane, select by points. But I most of the time go by manual selection 
and just drag a selection over it and then hit delete. This is very simple and straightforward. And by the way, when you want to turn your camera, because now you can't <laughs> when you're in this selection mode, yeah, you have to pause here the mode and then you can turn your camera like so. And then you have to resume your selection again. So it's a little bit clunky, but uh, I've had much worse. I've had much worse. So I think that was all of the stray um, of the stray polygons and vertices. So this is pretty much actually this is pretty much it. We couldn't. Uh, uh, I mean, we could have also um, cut uh, the model up by using a bounding box just to show you. Cut with bounding box is okay. So I'm now on in the wrong mesh. So cancel and select my mesh cut here and tools mesh filters cut with bounding box. Why? Why doesn't it work like I want it to work? But yeah, you, you get the gist of it. It's a bounding box and everything that is inside the bounding box will be kept and everything that's outside of it will be cut. Big surprise. <laughs> so mesh cut one. So this is what we want. And why is this red? Probably because I had selected it. Is this still a selection? I don't like the look of this, but it looks like a selection. It looks like a selection. By the way, if we are interested in um, the how it looks without the colors, for one thing we have here, uh, when you hit um, the colored Triforce, there is uh, the wireframe preview. But if you don't want to see it already with, uh, with the colors on, if you're just interested in the integrity of the model, you can hit here uh, the shader options, which is the brush right next to it. And then you can select the shader. And yeah, this is a little bit clunky, but the test shader here is just this one here. So you can really see where all the vertices are, uh, where how dense the polygon is, where there are more uh, the polygon, the mesh is, where there are more information, more polygons or less. And sometimes this is also helpful when you want to, uh, for example, delete stuff where you don't have a lot of information because it pertains, pertains to the background or anything. For example, here with those two, uh, actually there should be a gap, right? But uh, the algorithm produced here this kind of, of soft bridge. So this might be something that we would clean up later. Again, it doesn't have any uh, any texturing as of now. Uh, what I try now is uh, to get, well, not entirely rid of, of this uh, artifact edge here, but smooth it out a little bit. And for this, we need to filter the mesh. So I'm... Um, Got different shaders here. I just close it here. And tools, mesh filters. We can have a decimation, which is of course helpful when we want to use it as a game asset, but of course it loses some of the fidelity. My advice would be to do the mesh decimation when you are or know <laughs> an artist, modeling artist. Of course, it's always better if you to use ZBrush or Mudbox or any kind of those tools where you have a lot of options to, to, yeah, to, just to play with the mesh. Otherwise you can have the algorithm just throw out every other polygon, for example. So what I want to do now is a bilateral smoother or a Laplacian smoother. Let's go with a bilateral. And there you can select uh, how many iterations uh, this filter will go over the mesh. So let's just say apply filter and everything should be a little bit smoother than before. Well, is it? At least now we got here, we got here some artifacts like this little crack there that's just protruding. This doesn't look too good. <laughs> so um, yeah, let's let's say undo. But yeah, actually, actually, uh, <laughs> it was there before. So maybe we want to clean this up later on. But yeah, let's say redo. It's it's a little bit softer at least. It's a little bit softer. Maybe we can do the cleanups later on or for now we just leave it as it is. Okay, so what we want next is of course the texture of this thing. Uh, texturing, I uh, always say um, to do it last because otherwise, um, if you recall, we just clipped out this whole white plate before that we wanted to get rid of uh, this thing here. Because if you do the texturing in the first step along with creating everything else, well, then of course you're creating a lot of texture space. You're wasting a lot of texture space to keep this white solid in there that you will cut out anyway. So 
Once you're happy with your mesh, in my case, this one here is mesh one cut. Then we can go to workflow and say textured mesh generation. Yeah, let's create a textured mesh from this. And we can say, yeah, which mesh we want to use. This was mesh one cut and what cameras to use. And we say, yeah, all 50 cameras. Or we can just uh, use a certain amount of camera or just certain cameras when we know, for example, there's a shadow or anything that's, that's wrong with it. So, But we say now we want to use 50 cameras. And of course, you also got here is settings for presets, which is, yeah, just uh, you can't do anything wrong. And uh, as a texture size, let's go with 4K textures, maximum vertices, because um, uh, this will not only generate a mesh, uh, will not only uh, generate textures, but also create a new mesh out of this. And this is why we can set here uh, maximum vertices. Maximum number of textures uh, in VFX for uh, films, uh, for example, sometimes you really need huge textures where it's like it's not even a question of 8K or 16K, but it may be 128K textures. So you can't have this one in memory all at once. So you use uh, multiple textures that have different uh, for different patches on, on the model. But for us, I think for a game, 4K textures for, for this uh, pile of rocks should be more than enough. And the color balance strength is um, if there are different uh, uh, exposures between um, different uh, cameras for certain parts on the model, like we have in this case where at one point uh, the model was facing or one rock or stone was facing the light and then 180 degrees later it was facing the shaded thing. So this is trying to, to balance it out. And of course, there's the blurriness weights and the photo consistency weighting. And this is what I said uh, way at the beginning where I said, yeah, we don't have to worry too much about uh, blurriness because here we can have the algorithm try to understand, okay, this looks blurry. Maybe I don't, I won't need this part of, uh, for the texture from this camera, from this photograph, but rather from an other one that isn't blurry in this one here. So for now, let, let's try this. Let's try this. Why not? Next. Okay. Here we got um, our overview. And again, we got uh, our progress bars, our system info with the CPU total going all the way up to 100%. And of course, my trusty log. Okay. Let's have a look in the chat. What? I never heard of 120K. What is it used for? For example, when you're doing... Uh, yeah, VFX for, uh, let's say, Avatar, and you have this huge ass rock formation. And it's for once it's shot, uh, of course, in a, a wide shot in the beginning. And then your actors or digital actors are standing right next to it. And of course, it will be stereo 3D, so you can't really cheat. And it will be like 4K in the cinema in the end. So you need to have, this is the rule of thumb for, for yeah, theatrical VFX production. You need more texels, that is pixels on a texture, or more polygons most of the time, but it's usually it's texels, than pixels on the screen. So if anything is, if you get 4K, uh, <laughs> cut out of 4K from a huge model, this one thing that's on screen needs to be textured in with enough fidelity that it doesn't get blurry or pixely or anything and gives away um, uh, that it's it's not an actual thing there. Uh, most of the time you can cheat yourself around it, but sometimes you really just can't or especially you want to have your models with the highest fidelity as possible in the first place. And then if you need to do things differently on a per shot basis, you can do. But most of the time it's, it goes bigger is better. Okay, so this is now our textured mesh and it looks a little bit blurry, but this is probably because I sometimes I bumped the camera uh, just a little bit when I was photographing. The other thing is here uh, in between we got some ugly artifacts, but for now we will keep them in. But this is of course a downside there because not many camera angles could see into this crack here. So there is not a lot of information there. So if you get uh, an uh, object with lots of, uh, yeah, these little cavities, um, it's problematic. <laughs> and uh, it would have been best, 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 better. It would have been better maybe to shoot all those uh, stones individually and then mesh them together. But for now, sometimes you need a stone pile 
in the background and you can see here where the information is really lacking where we don't have anything so maybe we want to cheat around uh, showing this in the end when we put it in the game and of course here because like i said uh, the stones were a little bit moving between the shots we get this ugly artifact here because it looks okay but then from this point it, it doesn't and so on yeah we got here some floaty vertices and stuff so this is pretty much you would uh, stuff that you would clean up later on and as is visible here this is a blurry texture and this is a somewhat sharp texture and this just just uh, yeah was meshed together pun intended <laughs> so yeah this is not close up uh, uh, material <laughs> but maybe depends on what you want to use it for it will work in a game the other downside is of course that we have already baked in uh, ambient occlusion which might not be a problem but like i said before if you could maybe do some re uh, delighting stages okay so we got our our model how many polygons does it have well it's still still a lot of polygons so um let's uh, try now to do uh to reduce uh, the complexity of the mesh and i'm not certain if if this is okay if i do it after texturing because probably it is not mesh filters let's say um decimation and of course yeah we are here back at our mesh it put us right back into the mesh and because we can't do this from a textured mesh the texturing always happens at the end so okay let's let's try this one more time and i will let's make a game asset out of this one and let's say um you know what i can actually delete this one here because we we're never going to use this one anyway so i remove it we also don't need this one remove and all the meshes that is left is this one here and let's decimate it for use in a game um mesh filters decimation so target vertices we can uh, specify now here let's say maybe eighty thousand vertices should be enough preserve boundaries constrain distances from the input mesh whatever this means clone and apply filter clone means that we get a new entry here for for the result so in terms anything doesn't work out as we want it we can always go back uh, without having to resort to the undo function essentially Phil, may I ask how you did find your passion for digital color coloring and VFX stuff? Is it something you were always interested in? Oh my God, what happened here? <laughs> oh God, uh, this is not good. I will answer your question in a bit. <laughs> I think, I think we need to do something about this mesh. One cut. Uh, yeah, D, D, delete, remove. There. Apparently, something went wrong here. Mesh decimation. What? What the hell did I do wrong? decimation so maybe i should say preserve boundaries and constant distances maybe maybe this should do it and let's say 100,000 or did i say just thousand let's go with 100,000 and see how things are going <laughs> oh crap i don't know how this thing counts because clearly this didn't look like 80,000 or 100,000 polygons to me this looked like hundred that all just bunched together <laughs> in the middle oh crap and this is not going to work is it this is not going to work yeah you know what let's don't do this let's see if i can get it to work in maya so at least here we got our textured mesh and it's not uh, too high poly i mean if you're a triple a developer this could be okay for your medium-sized set piece um, count. Depends uh, how often this model shows up in different uh, uh, rotations or orientations throughout the level. But you know what? Let, let's go with this for now. So how to get this thing out of here? Um, it is, um, I think, export, right? This beautiful button here, I think, export textured mesh yes this is what i want and we can say here which one do we want to export and the texture type i don't think it is possible to change a texture type in the free version for now i mean jpeg is not too bad it's not too badly compressed there and i want an obj 
and export the normals, of course, rescale texture too. Well, we don't have to rescale it, so it just uh, stays as it is. Export a single texture, this is important for me, and the rest is cool. So yeah, the comment is fine. So where do we export it to? Well, I had it here on the, none of the 3D models. It was on the desktop and I promo, let's call it model. I think that was here, model. Let's call it stone pile 01. And this is an OBJ. So, and that was that for the export. So if we have a look at the folder, if you're not familiar with the OBJ file format, it's pretty much the plain text version of 3D models. It's it's like an SVG for vector graphics. Oh, sorry. It's, uh, yeah, it's an S key. Where we have it. It's uh, You can see it's, it's now almost uh, 19 megabytes in size. If I just show you in, in Notepad what it looks like, it looks like this. It just says here it's an OBJ file and which material it uses and a list of all the polygons. Just says here vertex at this position, vertex at this position. And once it got all the vertices defined, it just plots the edges. Uh, VT, I think that's vertex tangent and VN is vertex normal and F is, I think it's just an edge or is it uh, a UV texture coordinate? I'm not quite sure, but you can see there how it works. And in the end, it just says how many triangles there are and end of file. So this is the texture, uh, not the texture, the, the, the exchange format, the OBJ format. Then it got an MTL file. This is the material definition which is, it's one kilobyte, it just says if it's a fong or a, what kind of shader it used. And, but important for us is, let's have a look at the texture because uh, the texture coordinates are not what, yeah, what you would expect it to, to look like. You, essentially, you can't really work uh, with this texture. I mean, for this, it's, it's almost okay because you got here some uh, bigger sections uh, that were taken out of the photo, but as soon, as there are some uh, yeah, inconsistencies, it just splits up and does the texturing on a per face basis. So you can't really work with this. So you have pretty much say, yeah, this is <laughs> this is what, what I will work with. If you want to change something on the texture, you have to reproject it in your 3D software. Okay, talking about 3D software, this is the beautiful Maya 2020. And let's import our object. Where do I have it? Almost forgot. All right, I put it on the desktop because why not? So there is our OBJ file and it should even import there with the texture. And this is what it looks like. Maybe let me zoom in. Of course, yeah, since Maya uses a different coordinate system than uh, most 3D software, uh, everything is, you need to turn it by 90 degrees. At least Unity knows if something comes from Maya and flips uh, the, the um, the axis again, because in Maya, up is the Y axis and uh, yeah, and uh, the Y and the Z axis are actually actually switched because Maya comes from uh, uh, yeah cinema and visual effects. So you got your X and Y coordinates like you would have in a 2D and Z is into the image. And in other software, like I think uh, 3D Studio Max, it comes from more of an architectural background. <laughs> And there, of course, you have Z goes upwards and it's X and Y on the ground. So yeah, this is just, just as an aside. Okay, Frank is back, uh, having missed the uh, annoying part. <laughs> and yeah, already we're now here in Maya and we have here the textured model. And you can see how many triangles or how many um, faces does it have? Yeah, it's 187,000. So let's try and reduce there the mesh a little bit. What we can also see is that here is a little hole in there. This we could have also uh, checked there in 3D uh, Cipher, just to uh, show you, because sometimes you have holes in your meshes. This happens actually pretty easily and you can fix those holes by going to mesh filters and uh, fill holes selective or watertight. Most of the times I want it to be selective because that means you can select uh, yeah, which individual hole you want to, to fill because otherwise it would also fill here um, uh, the, the ground plane, which 
I usually I don't want to just yeah just essentially just uh, blends uh, the vertices together so it's it's not just a recreation of a smooth texture where the hole is no it just squeezes them together so it's it's not very sophisticated but just to to show you okay so yeah um, if you want to do some cleanups here let's let's uh, just get rid of those those uh, pesky little stray faces there so I'm just zooming in good oh, and we got here some some floaty faces as well those are not good so we will get rid of these here I'm just just real quickly and not very um, professionally so I'm just going to select those faces there and delete them which will of course uh, leave some kind of holes there which is not too good uh, but yeah now they are overlapping those faces there it's not perfect <laughs> it's not perfect but I'm just I'm just doing a real quick fix where I'm just pulling those vertices there together yeah maybe I maybe I don't need this face either and there filled <laughs> and mm, yeah for for now for this stream it's okay but usually I would spend a lot of time just doing a lot of cleanups and at a certain point especially with this kind of uh, artifact edge that's happening here frankly I wouldn't bother trying to fix it here I would just do the all the process we had before of photogrammetry and try to get it right the next time because with photogrammetry you can just sit back and have the computer do its thing otherwise you would here just spend hours trying to manually eyeball it and fix it and it wouldn't it wouldn't make the model much better I think and yeah of course uh, those things here I'm, I'm <laughs> I won't be even touching right now <laughs> okay so let's um, like I said those little uh, stray uh, faces and polygons I want to get rid of those in Maya it's pretty easy you can say mesh and where is it just zoom in mesh and separate this separates all the meshes that aren't uh, connected to each other and because this is of 178 no 187 thousand um, faces it will take a while but it's it's gone now so now everything is here in a group and those are all the individual faces so just uh, just to show you um, polysurface one is the big one that we want to keep and everything else are just those stray little faces that I didn't catch and boy it's a lot of them it's 2000 can this be yeah it's 2500 little edges <laughs> so um, if I switch over here everything that is in this color here that is white is not connected so if you recall we just split here the we used the plane to to split it uh, uh, of the, the the photogrammetry model from from the uh, background yeah this didn't quite connect well so if I delete it it will look like this because apparently it didn't it wasn't quite uh, well <laughs> connected or fused essentially in the first place so um, what I'm going to do now is undo everything here undo undo why doesn't it undo oh my god the undo queue is turned oh my god why oh shit <clears throat> you know what I don't know why this happened that it reset here my preferences or preferences but uh, in Maya you can have a uh, settings where you can say how many undos you want I just have to find it there it goes undo and someone turned undo off I think it's even set to off by default who does that why okay let's let's just do it quickly again import my model <laughs> Now it's trying to turn it itself on its back. So there we go. And now I'm going to fuse of those uh, vertices together that here that happened there on the fringe of the uh, of the model. Because if I turn this down here, okay, this seems to be connected, but uh, as clearly is, um, yeah, clearly visible. Those though others are not. So what I'm going to first to do is is mesh tools no it's edit mesh and merge 
all the vertices together. So it's all the vertices that are on top of each other are actually treated as they are belong to the same model. As they are belong, all your base are belong to us, what the hell. Okay, so this is done. So if I take now this face here and move it, it's connected properly to all the other faces. This is good, this is what we want. And it took me way too long to figure this out, that it could be done like this. And now, um, again, I say mesh and separate. And hopefully this should go faster because it's not 2,500 something. No, it's just two. It's just two. And look, this is surface one and this is surface two. You don't even see it. It's just this one thing there. Because I fused all the, the vertices together, all the, the little things that we saw before were just merged to nothing. So essentially I cleaned up the mesh quite well. Because now I got, uh, if you recall, we got 187,000 polygons and now it's 131,000. So this is already a bit better. And let's reduce it a bit more. Um, you know what, let's save this thing here. Let's call it um, pile version 01. And what you have to do in Maya, because Maya, even if when the undo queue is turned off, it has uh, uh, some kind of history, which is called, I think it's even called the history graph or something. And I need to delete this first when I want to do anything else. This uh, pretty much says it bakes everything that uh, so, uh, some model is affected by something. For example, if you have kind of deformers that turn something or twist something, this is always retained unless you say, yeah, I want to delete the history and then it just bakes. And this also is here that I'm split the mesh and, and yeah, separated it. This is also uh, a history operation in a sense. So I have to delete the history. Yeah, this is Maya. You have to know these things. So delete by type history. There we go. And now I can move it out there of the group and it still retains everything. Okay, let's reduce the mesh. This is what we are here for. Mesh, no, mesh, reduce. There we go. Oh, we, all, we, we even get remesh tools now and re uh, topologize, which is cool. But I don't think that the UVs, um, the texture coordinates would play well with that. By the way, if you would just want to have a look at where the texture coordinates are here in the UV editor, this is the texture page and where everything <laughs> lands. So yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just a huge cluster fudge. By the way, all those white edges there in the model, uh, these, are, uh, these are where a, a, a congruent or continuous texture uh, uh, is split. So pretty much here, especially on, on the lower on the lower rim, you can see there's a texture as a new texture shell for <laughs> essentially each face. Yeah, uh, many downsides to photogrammetry, but of course, so many upsides. I don't have to model those stones <laughs> myself. So, okay, reduce options. So let's say we want to reduce it to a certain triangle limit and we want to have it not more than 50,000 triangles. So you know what, let's go with, yeah, 50,000 should be fine. And um, you I can specify here the influence of mesh borders and UV borders and color borders. So yeah, the UV borders, uh, not that important to me. Hard edges, crease edge, yeah, those are not too important to me. And I just say apply and it says, what does it say here? Cannot reduce polygons with non-manifold geometry. Oh yeah, right. Like I said, um, when I said I cleaned up the mesh before, this is sometimes when for example, when three vertices like these are very close together and they get merged and they're just one point, but they also are a polygon and those are called non-manifold polygons. Well, not, not this essentially, but there, yeah, there are a lot of uh, polygons that aren't, um, that this mesh is not a valid mesh because there are polygons that are inside other polygons or overlap or something like this, or zero edges, edges uh, that have zero length because they just got merged together. Okay, but we can use to clean this up there. There's this, this cool tool called cleanup. <laughs> and there we go. So we can say clean up matching polygons, apply to selected objects. And what do we want to fix? Faces with more concave, uh, faces with holes, uh, non-planar faces. 
laminar faces that are faces sharing all edges. Those were laminas and non-manifold geometry and normals and geometry. And let's hit apply and hope that it won't die on me because it's still a lot of polygons. <laughs> Wow, still 11 concurrent viewers. This is a lot. And look at this. It got cleaned up and it's a mess. Oh no, what happened? Look at this. Holy crap, this was not good. Okay, we learned another thing today. <laughs> okay, at least I can, I can undo things. But we learned another thing today that photogrammetry produces meshes that are not 100% uh, cool. Excuse me. And when we try to optimize it in Maya via cleanup, it really doesn't work well. Maybe I can massage all those values there that it works. Maybe or maybe not. Uh, there's there's this one trick that I sometimes sometimes works is uh, if you scale up the model by a large amount, um, because here we got all those these tolerances that are very very yeah uh, minor. And if you scale something up, um, maybe some of those things won't uh, affect the model. But I'm not very hopeful <laughs> because we got a lot of crappy faces in this one here. But look at this. It's a bit better than it was before. Still got this odd implosions here. Yeah, Maya, really? You think this is more correct than before? What, what were you smoking? Yeah, let's not go the route and say, yeah, 131,000 polygons are good for my game. My game is going to be a triple A game, at least <laughs> in uh, recommended system specs. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. So, okay, let's, let's get this out there and into Unity at last after two hours of this stream, finally. Okay, select everything. Um, and maybe, you know what, maybe let's, let's call it stone pile. Of course, now I could, if I wanted to change uh, things there with uh, the uh, texturing, but I just want to make sure that it also has, by the way, this is, it works a bit like shader graph in Maya. We have here your texture coordinates, your file, and then your shader, and then the shading group. So the shading group is stone pile one. The shader is called, it's a Fong shader. Yeah, it's it's not uh, Fong shaders. I think the last time I used a Fong shader in production was 20 years ago. <laughs> um, because they are not physically correct. By the way, neither are Blin shaders. You want to use some kind of uh, physically based uh, shader nowadays. Because even games can do physically based rendering. But uh, now I just want to make sure that it's named correctly. Okay, finally we can export this. So I go to file and what's the most straightforward thing? Export selection and then I can set certain um, yeah, settings. For use with uh, Unity, I export it as a DXF, uh, no, as, a, as an FBX, this one here. And you can say even that it includes references or lights or camera, but I don't need this. So I just say save and close. And, oh, it didn't ask me where I want. Oh, it's safe to save the settings of this dialog box. Oh, of course. So export selection, try this once again. There we go. And I save it to, you know what? I will already have already have set up a Unity project. It's I think it's on the desktop. I think, you know what? Let me, let me quickly check <laughs> where I saved it to or 3D. Um, this, is, this is what happens when you do a, a stream, when you think like, oh, photogrammetry would be nice, and then you have no idea where you put all those things. Okay, I think I put it under, I'm just saying this for myself, when I'm, when I'm looking for it, it's under L and photogrammetry demo. So my computer, L, where is L, Terbium, there we go, photogrammetry demo, because this is my Unity project that I already set up. It's not much of a setup, just put it under assets and let's yeah, let's make a new folder and call it um, stream that we know it's from the stream and call it um, stone pile, version one perhaps. 
Okay, this takes a little bit too long to save, <laughs> but okay, it's, it's cool. You know what, I keep Maya open in the background while I launch Unity. And cross our fingers um, that it, it works. Uh, yeah, still, I uh, have to answer your question, Vitaly, um, how I find my passion for digital color grading and VFX. I think even as a kid, I always had this uh, interest in how films are made and how movies and how games are made. And I think when I first uh, saw in some uh, Nintendo magazine how they did the rendering for Donkey Kong Country, I was just fascinated with that, that you have this model and then you put on textures and, but the computer does the rendering and oh my God, it looks so real. And I, I really didn't first understand it, how it worked, but yeah, this I think this was the starting point for me, and then it, I'm just ner was very nerdy and into this, and yeah, how how things um, worked worked, and then I just yeah, like a sponge, I just try to uh, learn as much about making movies and making computer stuff and anything, and then just kept trying around, and yeah, essentially just did stuff that <laughs> I just kept doing what interested me as a kid, and this is where we are today. Okay, so um, if you're a little bit uh, uh, worried why Unity looks so big is because I set um, the um, scaling to 200% because I'm getting old. <laughs> but okay, let's... Uh, yeah, and I start just a new project here with the HD render pipeline just that we can see how it looks when everything is nice. So detail render, yeah, 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 whatever. So where are our stream settings? Uh, there is our stone pile. Okay, now that's the moment of truth. Let's drop it in there and see how puny it is. Okay, this is another thing. Maya, uh, you probably have to say which, uh, or what what, what uh, me kinds of measurements uh, or measurement units you're using it. I think I'm using millimeters now. So I have to scale it up like a, a thousand percent, like so. Okay, this looks nice. The only thing that's missing, of course, is the texture. But, I mean, look at this. This is already in the game. It looks like the model that we want it to be. And, of course, why shouldn't it be the model that we want it to be? <laughs> okay, now we only have to get the texture in, of course. And I have no idea how to do this with a model that you've already did there. Uh, I have had there. Okay. Um, now I'm turning to the chat. And see, um, thanks, Phil, for not forgetting. I, of course, <laughs> anything for my viewers. I, I have so little viewers, I have to take care of all of you because you're so dear to my heart. Otherwise, I would be just talking into the void. <laughs> okay, um, how to get the freaking texture there? Why didn't the texture get exported with this thing? Maybe I, maybe I turned it off. Or maybe the texture is located somewhere else where it can't find it. So it's just the color texture. You know what? I will just try to import the texture also. Maybe it's because the texture is not itself inside the Unity Assets folder. So I just put it there. And it should show up. Yeah, this was the reason. So look at this. Now we got our stone pile here, including all those horrible little artifacts there. We got it in Unity. And of course, this is the cool thing when we turn the sun. Where is the sun? Directional light, there, there we go. There it is. Just that we can behold its glory. Of course, um, it reacts to whatever we have here in our settings. And you know what? Let's go to game and move a little bit around and see <laughs> how bad it looks. There we go. How do I turn this? Yeah, right mouse button. So this is our model there in the high definition render pipeline in Unity. And it's ugly, oh my God. But we didn't have to lift a single finger in terms of modeling and it still looks like a stone pile that you can use in the end. Of course, it already has this baked in kind of uh, ambient occlusion and the texture could be a little bit better, but is, I think this is now probably to Unity because it scaled it down here for the preview. 
But it looks nice. It looks nice. And look at this beautiful god rays here of the high definition render pipeline. This is some gorgeous stuff. Yeah, so that's essentially the gist of it, of getting your models or pretty much anything that you have lying around or want to get uh, uh, into a game, actually into a game as a 3D model without spending too much money apart from, in my case, uh, a lot of money for Maya and of course Photoshop and the camera and this thing here. So yeah, it's a little bit of an investment but at least uh, we didn't have to pay for um, the meat of it that was this recreation of the 3D model from photographs. Uh, let me just crack my knuckles uh, and my neck. Uh, this, this wasn't too good. I don't feel my legs anymore. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so yeah, I hope this was interesting to you. This was uh, maybe a little bit entertaining even, and I'm sorry if, if there's if I rambled a little bit and had a lot of <laughs> info be dumped on you. But um, I hope uh, you get uh, at least some, some sense of um, what are the troubles involved with photogrammetry, maybe what you can use it for, where it works for you or where it doesn't work for you. And yeah, just that it's a lot of work and you can, there are so many things that you can get wrong. And sometimes it's just um, faster to just do things over again, like here with those, uh, uh, artifacts of, of this stone here. Man, this, this looks almost intentional. <laughs> but yeah, I hope this was interesting. Let's have a look at the chat. I'm off to school. Oh, oh, bye. Bye. And nice to see the process from beginning to end. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you for, for watching from beginning to end. How do you even crack your neck? I've always wanted to do that. I don't know. I don't know. Just do it like this and sometimes it cracks. But my fingers crack by themselves if I'm not using them probably getting arthritis in two years. <laughs> Look at that, he made it only in one hour and 30 minutes. Really? I thought it was two hours and six minutes, but this is at least the amount for which I'm streaming. But yeah, in the end, it's a lot of trial and error, but I hope I was able to show you a little bit of the intended way of doing things. But uh, if you want to do this, uh, please, by all means, we need more cool 3D models. And the downside, of course, is it's a lot of it's a lot of polygons. But the upside is, hey, look at this. This is how it looks in the real world. And this is how it looks in the game. And no modeling skills required whatsoever. Just a lot of patience. <laughs> um, I recommend against getting arthritis in your fingers. Uh, I did that and I regret it. Oh, yes. So, so not um, cracking your knuckles, right? I've been doing this since I was a teenager and I asked my doctor and she said, yeah, it's, it's not too bad if you if it's always been like that. So yeah, just don't do it as often, but they crack themselves. So yeah, try to refrain from that. As always, stay healthy, everyone. And oh, oh Mr. Julius is there. Hello, <laughs> I'm almost, almost uh, done for today. But I just want to give you a little update, as always, of what I've been up to, what things I've been doing the past uh, days and weeks. And for me, like I said, the past weeks, I didn't get a lot of stuff done for YouTube or my my other endeavors um, because, yeah, work got in the way. For one thing, of course, I'm employed to do color grading. And then, of course, I'm self-employed and doing, doing other stuff, also color grading and this time also 3D modeling. So this is why last week I had to cut uh, things short. But this week it works because apparently no one's working over the weekend. So I didn't get any feedback notes. So I had the time <laughs> to do this. Um, the other thing that I've been uh, been busy with uh, very much so was um, maybe you recall, where do I have it? I uh, don't have one here. Uh, yeah, maybe let's use this. Um, I have this little... Um, notepad and notepad design i des designed this couple of years ago and then i made a new one and some people asked hey this looks cool are you selling it and i said huh i might and i thought yeah just throw up a little web shop and then be able to sell it to people all around the world turns out um all the web shop solutions that i found uh didn't do what i wanted to do there are some web shops where you just have to pay uh, it's yeah, like Etsy or so. I don't think Etsy is, a, is one of those, but there are some where you have to pay to just to keep your shop presence and so on and so forth. And either of them had one 
essential drawback that I couldn't do without. Long story short, so I decided to code my own web shop and really dig into databases and CSS and PHP and even JavaScript. So to have to come up with a nice little web shop where you can say, yeah, I want this amount of that uh, notepad and this amount of that notepad. Then it calculates the shipping f to your country and it calculates how many packages it will need to ship in. And if there are any restrictions in terms of weight, and in size of those packages and how it affects the shipping cost. And then it will send you an email and register itself as an order and also sends me an email and so on. So it's just, yeah, this, this whole entire backend. And I thought, yeah, this can't be too bad. And in the end I spent the past two weeks, but now I'm almost getting to a place where I can say, yeah, I think, I think this is possible. This is not entirely waterproof, but at least good enough. Um, to, to work and to, to be able to order things. And also my shop will tell me when something is out of stock and how to handle this. So I'm very proud of that, but it's nothing interesting to show. It's just 2000 lines of PHP code <laughs> that constructs uh, JavaScript. So um, I guess I'm a web developer now. <laughs> Okay, um, the chat says, just shut up and take my money and I will soon, so no worries about uh, me not taking your money, but I probably won't shut up. This is, sorry. And my arthritis is some autoimmune thing, nothing to do with any habit I have. No need to panic if you like cracking joints. Oh, good, oh, good. And I'm sorry that it's some kind of autoimmune thing, so I hope it doesn't affect you too much, but but then again, we always got games to make us feel happy and distract us from any ailments we might have. At least sometimes this worked for me when I was in bed with fever and now there's coronavirus. So all we can do is just play games <laughs> and look at the bright side of things. Man, this turned this turned pretty, pretty dark <laughs> towards the end. I'm sorry. Oh, Red Hermit is there. Oh my God. Thank you so much for dropping by Red Hermit and thank you for congratulating me becoming a web dev. I, I don't think I uh, should allow anyone to have a look at my code that I produce <laughs> for for web programming. Well, maybe one day, but it's not pretty. But then again, on the other hand, I'm probably too much modularizing things that I can I can uh, reuse. Uh, yeah, reuse portions of it for for different stuff. But the big problem is that is now that I'm I'm at a uh, some kind of uh, conceptual problem where I was trying to pass an array as an argument to another array and PHP said, I'm not going to like this. And yeah, right now I have to uh, restructure all those things and rethink my architecture of how I did things. So, so how complicated can a web shop be? If you ask me, it can become very complicated. <laughs> So this is uh, where things are with me right now. The other thing that is uh, upcoming, of course, is it's almost Ludum Dare time. I think it's some week in April and we're already in March right now. So it's just a couple of weeks uh, into the future. And I'm very much looking to participate in it. And also, as always, shooting uh post-mortem and as always working on my Ludendara 42 post-mortem which i've been neglecting the past weeks like i said i didn't uh, have time for anything besides work and other work and the web shop so I'm, I'm really sorry if i haven't been that present uh lately but yeah on the on the plus side is as once when you're really decked with work that you have to do the back of your mind goes always, huh, this would be interesting. This would be a fun little project and this would be a nice video. So I put all those little ideas into my personal wiki, which are also set up for myself <laughs> um, that I keep track of, of them so that I can produce stuff because man, I'm really itching to, to, to make, to get some more stuff made. And also the bad thing is, is I'm itching to make a game, but I don't know have or I don't have any idea what game to make, but I've played some old DOS games, partly for the DOS Game Club. If you haven't checked it out, uh, please do dosgameclub.com. We are a nice little community of old farts playing old DOS games. It's nice. And then of course, sometimes I hear of an old game I haven't heard of in some podcast, and then I dive all in and then play some Infocom game that's set in a, a Persian um, cyberpunk uh, setting. Why the hell not? <laughs> okay, let's wrap things up. I have a one last look at the chat. Did you at least implement your own wiki? Of course not. Implementing my own wiki means setting up a media wiki. 
so that I can log into it myself and run some custom CSS because I want to look things look nice. So this is, yeah, I implemented it myself. Let's let's say it like this. <laughs> Looking forward to the Ludum Dar. I hope you all join. Yes, I hope so too. By the way, uh, theme uh, suggestions are open and I hope you put in some good suggestions uh, because we all know they won't be picked. So this is why I think I, I tried so many uh, or I went over so many suggestions. I think I even uh, uh, suggested coronavirus because probably everyone does because it's the next big thing. And <laughs> last week I thought, ah, oh, maybe I should do a stream where we play uh, a Pandemic Inc. Or was it Pandemic Inc.? Or Plague Inc. That's the game where we will play as the coronavirus and try to kill the entire planet. Isn't this fun? <laughs> Oh, Phil, you should do a live stream and finding an idea for LDE uh, for the weeks. No, you don't want a live stream and I don't want one because the live stream would be, you know what? Um, I show you how the live stream would look like. Okay, this is my Oscar performance for Ludendahl 46 trying to find an idea. I hate the theme. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think this would be very interesting <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, being overly hard to myself and I'm just trying to beat myself up. And when I'm talking about my ideas and I probably get more depressed <laughs> than anything else. Um, this is also, I don't think I will ever, ever, what's, what's ever, well, ever stream a Ludum Dara experience because for me it's, it's just it's this very personal thing where it's okay if I know that the camera is running but I don't have to pay attention to it because as soon as I'm streaming I have this weird urge you might have noticed it to entertain to keep talking to explain what I'm thinking what I'm doing the good thing is that you know what's going on with me but the bad thing is that I feel um that I have to voice everything is that I don't feel I can make any progress. For example, uh, uh, the stream today I would have uh, done uh, with uh, probably in half an hour, 40 minutes, and it took us almost like two hours because I really wanted to explain things. And I can't or I cannot not do this. So this is probably why I, I, won't, be I won't be streaming. The theme is perfection, perfect. The theme is perfection, just polish your game. Cool, so I don't have to make a game and just polish. This is fine with me. <laughs> I already got some ideas. Maybe some of those I could work into a game. But then again, as soon as I have an idea beforehand, I know it's not going to happen. <laughs> okay, so I've been streaming for 2 hours 17 minutes and almost out of water. I say unicorn. Oh, by the way, one last thing. I bought a domain that is unicornhugs.me <laughs> and I will, uh, as soon as I have some time and inspiration, I will put up some encouraging, uplifting unicorn memes, which probably will be just open source pictures of horses with horns photoshopped onto them and some uplifting text. So yeah, look out for that. <laughs> anyway, have a great evening, have a great night and I will try now uh, in my OBS that's not uh, allowing me to use studio mode to switch over to my uh, thank you note. Okay, I think I got it sorted out. Again, thank you so much for watching uh, for uh, 12 concurrent viewers throughout this very intense uh, or very uh, technical and probably exposition laden talk. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for watching. Have a great night. Have a great rest of Sunday for some of you. For me, not as much. Sunday ends in half an hour. Either way, have a great week. Maybe see you next week or the week after that. Me streaming. This happens. This happens with me. So I think <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm I'm not good with computers. I, I'm not good with computers. Bye.